thirst again. Hallelujah. For you have given us exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to your power that's in us. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this evening. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Mike, Suzanne, and James. Great job as always. Hallelujah. I just feel the presence of the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. Amen. Appreciate those of you that are here tonight. Glad you, glad you decided to come out and be with us. And uh, Sally's at home obsessing over her lists. That's what she does. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I'm a little more random, and that's probably a better word than spontaneous. <laughs> or a little more accurate, at least. But um, anyway, she, so she's, uh, she's taking care of that stuff, and, and we're all here enjoying the Lord. Praise God. Uh, I want to ask, uh, first of all, if anyone has any prayer requests. Everybody doing good? God's working miracles in your life? Amen. Mike. Yeah. Amen. I was going to I was going to say too, why don't we pray uh for Saturday? Uh we want it to be a good time for everybody. Uh enjoy it and uh, uh just have a good time with one another and with the Lord. And uh it's you know just a good chance to get together with each other and kind of be able to you know we're always kind of rushed even when we hang around after service because there's you know there's always different people and you get kind of distracted one another so we've got we'll have time to be able to spend a little quality time if you will with one another and kind of get to know each other a little bit better and and by that we'll get to know the Lord a little bit better right amen. the more I know you the better I know the Lord and vice versa amen that's so that's what we're really after is just for everybody to have a good time and just relax and enjoy themselves with uh, with the family of God amen, amen. praise the Lord yes Suzanne Yes, thank the Lord. We thank the Lord for that right now, for even greater testimonies to come. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your healing power. Praise the Lord. Well, if there's no other prayer request, James, go ahead. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God knows and he'll he'll definitely intervene. Praise the Lord. I, I just thought too while James was talking I uh, let's remember Ron, or, uh, Dan uh, he's uh, having some health issues and uh, 
we don't really know what the whole situation is, but uh, God knows, and that's what really matters. And yes, Diane, uh, they're seeking the Lord for the direction that God wants to go in terms of how to deal with uh, some of her ongoing situations, and uh, that's always wise. So let's remember Diane as well, that uh, God will just intervene there, and uh, and all of these situations to where we don't need the doctors and we don't need all the medications and all the other things. Great if we do, God's provided that, but uh, amen. Let's just believe that God can move in these situations and uh, we know that he can. We just believe that he has and uh, by faith we'll just uh, reach out and take it for him right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege of being able to come boldly to the throne of grace, knowing, Lord, that whatever we ask according to your will, it is done. It is ours. Hallelujah. We receive it. So, Father, right now, for all the needs that were mentioned here tonight, Lord, we receive the answer, your victory, Lord, your glory, your power to manifest, to show yourself mighty on our behalf, Lord. Minister as only you can, Lord, by the power of your spirit and through the love that you have for your people, Lord. And for that, Lord, we give you all the thanks, the praise, and the glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. Amen. All right. Praise God. Alvin, would you mind taking up the offering tonight? And if you would, you could pray for it as well. I saw you looking for your glasses. I was looking over some notes today. I'm telling you, I, this blows my mind sometimes. I'm looking everywhere for my pen. I'm sitting in the chair upstairs. I got a marker here. I got my cell phone over here. I got some notes in front of me, the Bible over here, and I'm looking everywhere for the pen. I can't find it. I stood up. I looked in the seat. I looked all around me. I sat down. It was in my mouth. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> they go, oh, Lord, have mercy. Ah, uh, well. All right. Praise the Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the blessings of the day and, and, uh, and the continual blessings you have given to our opponents. Yes. In such an abundant way. You know, we thought some things were impossible, but we kept interceding and, and, and uh, hoping, but our hope wasn't strong enough, I guess, Lord. We just let it go. Yeah. Praise the Lord, and God bless you as you give. And while Alvin continues to uh, take up the offering here, if, Mike, if you want to uh, go ahead and go to Matthew 23 and verse 13 is where we're going to begin tonight. And, uh, and because it's Wednesday night, we try to be brief so everybody can get home at a reasonable time before they have to get up and go back to work tomorrow. And I especially want to be brief tonight so I can get home and go over Sally's notes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if she's watching, I'll hear about all this when I get home. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. I want to thank Mike and Suzanne for uh, helping out so much with this get-together we're having Saturday. They, they provided tables and an awning, and, and now... Piste de resistance. <laughs> the cones. The cones, man. I mean, so for parking, praise the Lord. And I may borrow a couple of them from Mike permanently so I can put those between Sally's demolition derby vehicle and my pristine pickup. Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, praise God. God is good. Amen. We're all different, and there's good reason for it. Praise the Lord. Otherwise, it would all be redundant, wouldn't it? All right, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 13. God bless you again for being here tonight. And let's look to see 
what the word of God has for us. Amen. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. You know, uh, there's, in a human being, well, actually, the way we operate is uh, if, if we're uh, operating in the flesh, then it's all strictly about the senses, what we see, what we hear, what we taste, smell, touch. That's the flesh. That's just natural life, right? I mean, everything, all the information that comes to us physically is what dictates how we respond or how we live or how, what, how we go through life. Then on the other hand, there's uh, operating by the Spirit. If you operate by the Spirit, you're focused on the Word of God, what God has said, in spite of what your natural man might be telling you, okay? And then there's the, there's the self or the, uh, uh, say, let me say it this way, uh, the soul. And that is self-centered or self-focused. Now I'm talking about internally. So the, the, ob the objective is to get the soul to agree with the spirit. Now you're thinking and your reactions and all of your behaviors are going to be focused in the word of God. Then you can dominate those senses. Because even when you have pain... You can say to that pain, I'm healed in Jesus' name. Amen. When you get the bad bank statement, amen, and you can say to that statement, I'm prospered in Jesus Christ, amen. My God supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory. You see what I'm saying? So we have to get the soulish part of us to agree with who we are spiritually. And that's where the word of God comes in to keep us, our minds renewed, or our, our way of thinking renewed to the Word of God so we can dominate this. Yes. Now, th that's a major struggle because religion predominantly teaches you to control the flesh, discipline it. But without, without moving into the spirit realm, all you, it's all external. And you still got all these problems going on inside of you. Amen? So that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight. You know what I'm saying? In other words, that's what he's talking about being a hypocrite. Externally, everything looks good. But internally, it's all junk. It's all a mess. Mm -hmm. We're struggling with all this stuff, okay? So that's the, kind of the way I'm looking at this. So how many of you know, you ever watch these uh, old movies? Even when I was a kid, this, so, well, I guess those were old movies. But uh, even when I was a kid, you used to, they used to do things like, you know, you're about to get into a... Uh, you know, a confrontation with somebody, and they they draw a, a line in the dirt, you know, and don't step over that line, you know, and then, of course, you draw another line, and you just keep going. But the idea was, if you step over that line, we're going to tangle, you know, we're going to have a fight. That's the, that's the battle line, right? So that's kind of the way, don't cross the line, right? That's, that was the idea. Well, battle lines are drawn, and sides have to be chosen. And with a line in the dirt, you're either left standing side by side with the person you are in agreement with, or you're left standing face to face with the opposition. Now, when you find Jesus drawing a line in the sand, and you see it over and over throughout the Gospels especially, it's always with the same people. The same people are always standing in opposition and it's always this religious crowd. Yep. Now, the question is why? Because if you didn't know better, you'd expect that Jesus would be standing in opposition to sinners. That's kind of the, the way it's portrayed to people, right? That he would be against those people, the, the, the bad people, the people that, are, you know, in our minds we'd say that are struggling with the so-called big sins. But that wasn't the case. Now, whenever you see Jesus in a dispute of some kind, he's always in opposition with religious leaders of his day. 
people that were quick to judge, quick to shame, and to condemn. Now, I'm not saying this, you know, just to be controversial, but, I mean, think about this. We have all these issues with the homosexual groups and lesbian, gay, the whole thing. And, and that's just one particular thing, but it's one that really disturbs a lot of people. And quite frankly, it does me too, but, but, but where would Jesus stand in that? Now, it, it isn't because he's saying that's all good. It's just that he loves them. So whatever the sin is, you know, I'm just, I use that just simply because to, to most people it's, it's something that's just, you know, it's hard to grasp. It's hard to understand. And you think, just don't be that way. I mean, come on, get over it. You know, don't, don't be like that. And it's bad. It's not good. It's negative. It's all that. And yet, when I see how Jesus dealt with this, these kinds of situations, the woman in the, caught in the act of adultery, and over and over and over, there's all sorts of things like that. We might see homosexuality as a bigger thing. But it's because we have big sins and little sins. We think of certain things as being really bad, bad stuff, and other things just, well, it's not good, but it, you know, it could be worse. But Jesus doesn't look at it that way. And so we need to kind of reevaluate. And I'm not saying embrace the behavior. I'm saying you've got to love the people. that They cannot come to Christ without love. I mean, they're not going to come to, to a saving knowledge of God without somebody showing the love of God to them. No matter what the circumstances, I just use that as one, but I'm saying anything, no matter what it might be. Now, it's one thing to say that. It's another thing to do it when you're face-to-face with that particular problem or, or issue, right? So I see two foundational issues here uh, that seem to keep showing up over and over and over in the Gospels. First, Jesus valued people more than rules or more than policies, while the religious people were just the opposite. I mean completely opposite of that. So look at this now, Mike, Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Matthew 12, 1 and 2. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. The key word here is Sabbath day. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, your disciples do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. Now, if you look back through the book of Leviticus and throughout the Old Covenant and wherever there is uh, reference to the law, God had provided specific instructions for the Sabbath. And the reason for that was to show that his real desire for man was rest and restoration. But they were under a law, so they had to, there were things that they had to do. They chose that, and so that was the covenant they were in, so God had to base his response to the people on that covenant. But he had the Sabbath day was to show what his real feelings were about people. He wanted them to be able to rest. He wanted them to be able to be restored. Okay? So over the years, the Jewish leaders added laws upon laws, upon laws, to the point where people had to work harder on the Sabbath than any other day of the week just to stay in compliance with the laws. I mean, it got to be where there wasn't a day of rest. It was a day of complete anxiety and stress for fear that you might have missed one of these things that they had instituted. Now, it was a day that God intended to be a blessing. But it turned into a burden. It turned into a a curse almost. Amen. And literally hundreds of Sabbath laws and regulations were added by the Jewish leaders. Not by God, but just by people who said, well, if that's good, then a little more would be even better. Right? If, you know, that demand is something, let's just be stricter and and we'll be even better off. God will like us even more. God will do even better for us. But I'm just going to give you three or four Real quick, these are just some of them, but I mean, there were literally hundreds that they had added, but look at this. They were not allowed to filter undrinkable water. Now, remember the day that they're living in. There's a lot of bad water. That's why they drank as much wine as they did. Well, that was the excuse for drinking all the wine. But I mean, you know, go to Mexico, it's cerveza, man. I mean, I'm not drinking the water, right? But I'm just saying, 
they, the, one of the laws was you no filtering on drinkable water to make it drinkable. I mean, that doesn't even make any kind of sense, but that was one of the things that they added. Get this. No picking small bones from fish. I swear. I mean, imagine eating carp on the Sabbath. You're, you know, you're a candidate for the Heimlich maneuver for sure. Because it's just full of those little bones. No baking, no cooking, or no frying of food. So whatever you're eating, you, have, you had to cook it the day before. And now, they, the no refrigeration, there's no... So there's all sorts of potentials here for harm to people that these rules are being, you know, forced on them. Get this one. This is, this is great. No throwing objects in the air from one hand to the other because that would constitute work. I, I, get, I mean, seriously. I mean, who thinks this stuff up? Where, what were they doing when they thought that up? They must have seen some kid playing, you know, or something, and now we're not going to have any of that. It reminds me when we were in uh, East Texas, and the pastor who had, had retired, uh, he, still, he was like Pastor Emeritus. You know, he would preach every once in a while. He was preaching one time, and he said some kids came to him. Now, this is a holiness church. I mean, this is like this kind of in some ways. Very law and some kids came to him back in the 50s. Now, this is what this happened in the early 80s that he was telling the story, but this happened back in the 50s, and some kids came to him, and they said, Brother Hoyt, would it be okay if we play putt-putt golf is what they called it, but just miniature golf is what it is. And he said, of course, I'd never heard. He had never heard of putt-putt golf, so he said no. And he didn't even know what it was. <laughs> but they wanted to do it, so it must be bad, you know? I mean, these are, so if they're wanting to play, it, it, I mean, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Just makes no sense. It's just, you know, well, we're just going to really toe the mark here, and God's going to honor that because we're not playing putt-putt golf. We're spiritual. Yeah, exactly. Well, it was just a law for the sake of having another law, basically, you know. So anyway, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. So when the Pharisees... <clears throat> In, in this particular instance, when they saw the disciples violating one of their rules, they blew the whistle, thinking they had caught Jesus in the same thing. That's what they're really after here, right? So look at, now look at Matthew 12, verses 3 at, through 8. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was hungry, and that they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God, and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither of them, neither for them, which were with him, but only for the priests. The showbread is the bread that's in the temple, and that was the, that they ate that as they went about their duties in the, within the temple. And so David went in, and that was only for the priests that were ministering in the temple. David and his men were hungry. They were running from Saul. They went and ate it because it was the only food available. And so that's what Jesus is referring to. Did you ever read that, that David and his men ate the shoe bread that was restricted, that was only for the priest? Or have you not read the law? How that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. Think about it. You're not supposed to be doing any work, and the priests are in the, in, in the temple, and they're working all day long on the Sabbath. They're breaking their own law, Right? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. If ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Praise the Lord. He is our Sabbath. Praise God. Amen. So Jesus made it clear. He had a different value system. People trumped rules. People were more important than the rules. All right? Uh, on here in verse 10, staying in chapter 12. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? So they're, they're trying to set a trap for Jesus. There's a guy here with a withered hand, you know, palsy or something, you know, whatever. He's got, a, he's got a hand that doesn't work. 
and it's on the Sabbath day, and they asked him, and they said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they could accuse him if he said yes. Right? Well, Jesus had a trap of his own. Verses 11 through 13 now. And so Jesus responds by saying, he said to them, what man shall there be among you, the religious people, these priests, these rabbis and so forth, that shall have one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath day? Then saith he to the man, stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, just like the other one. Praise God. Amen. Then saith he, stretch forth, and it's restored. Amen. Now, imagine you're there in the front row watching all this. You're, you're right up front where all this has taken place. Amen. I'm thinking some oohs and some ahs and maybe even some applause when this guy's hand is immediately healed. Praise the Lord. Look at verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. He heals a guy, and he, he gets crossways with them and their rules, and their response is, let's figure out somehow that we can kill this guy. These are supposed to be the religious people. So there's another foundational issue here that shows up between Jesus and the religious. Jesus valued internal righteousness or internal transformation. Yes. And the Jewish leaders valued external righteousness. Yes. And that's what you find in so many religious settings to this day. Yes. And we, we, we look at the extreme say, well, that's so obvious. But the truth is it, it filters into almost every denominational setting. Matthew chapter 15, Mike, verses 1 and 2. And what I'm saying, the reason I'm saying all this tonight is because this stuff, we have been around it. Even if you weren't in a church that preached it, you get the, the, the kind of the repercussions from it or the, like the butterfly effect, you know. I mean, it just kind of gets out into the, into the world and everybody starts thinking on, in these terms. And so that when we come to God, and we need a miracle, or we expect that God, we, we, we want God to do something supernatural that he says in his word, immediately the first thing that comes back to us is this sense realm. This natural man starts saying, well, i am got to weigh my behavior against this and against that, and God's not going to do it for me because, and we start coming up with reasons. Yep. Instead of trusting in what God has put in us, the righteousness that in us, we have a tendency to want to look at the righteousness on the outside of us and say we're not measuring up. But that's not how Jesus ever measured anybody. He doesn't look at the outer man. He's not, he's not, a, not that concerned about it. It's the spirit that he's after. So then came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Really? He needs to come to my place sometime when the grandkids are there. <laughs> because, I mean, you, you, gotta, you really got to wash their hands because they're, they they're not thinking about it. You know, they're not worried about it, okay? But here's Jesus' answer, verse 3 through 9. He answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or mother, It's a gift by whosoever thou mightest be profited. It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And the honor, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. In other words, they're saying, the scripture says you're supposed to provide. You're supposed to honor your father and your mother. Instead of taking care of them, you're saying, oh, but I'm going to give this to the church, or I'm going to, I'm going to make this an offering. I'm going to do, this money is going uh, dedicated to the Lord somehow. Now, he's talking about the religious leaders. It's going in their pockets, what it amounts to. And because of that, you, you say, I'm good. 
I don't have to take care of them. I don't have to do this or I don't have to do that because I'm, I'm, I've made a dedication to this. And he says, because of that, you've made the commandment of God of none effect because of your tradition. You're hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, that's as if that weren't enough. Then Jesus calls the crowd that's gathered here, listening to all this, he calls them to himself, and look at verse 10 and 11. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. And it's not that which goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, you know that was freaking them out because they're thinking pork, they're thinking lobster, they're thinking crawfish. All that. Oh, that's bad stuff, man. You know what I mean? But he's saying, look, it isn't what goes in. It's what comes out. Amen. Now, the disciples didn't understand it. Look, uh, go on down to verse 17. Through 20. The disciples didn't get the connection here. And so Jesus says, Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out in the draught? You know that. I don't have to explain all that, right? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. They come from the soul. They come from the inner way that you think goes back to what I said at the very beginning, right? You're either connecting your soul with the spirit or you're connecting your soul with the flesh. And that's what he's saying here. But those things which proceed out of the mouth, they come from the heart, and they are what defile the man. So it's, it's where you set your thinking, by the spirit or by the flesh, okay? For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemy. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Praise God. Matthew 23 now. Let's go back there, Mike, and verse 27. See, it seems, it seems you know, logical, and, and I suppose it does to the natural mind. But Jesus is turning this whole thing upside down. And he's preparing them for the kingdom. And everything's going to be different. And he's trying to lead them into this way of thinking that just, you know, you've been operating under this legalistic law covenant that you wanted and haven't been able to keep. And I'm trying to show you how God really wants to interact with you. Not your perfect behavior, but your perfect condition spiritually that only God can give you. Man cannot make himself righteous, no matter how hard he tries. Okay, so woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like unto a whited sepulcher, which indeed appears beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Now, you know that was, that was like a slap in the face and a kick in the pants, praise the Lord. I mean, it was just about as rude and con confrontational as you could get. Now, here's the deal. Throughout his ministry... Jesus made it clear what really mattered to him. Right. Internal transformation or internal righteousness. Mm -hmm. And the whole Sermon on the Mount. You know, I mean, read, read that sometime. You can be morally compliant and still be full of hate. In other words, you can say, I've never killed anybody. I've kept the law. He said, no, if you've hated somebody... See, it's what's inside. Then you're, you're as guilty as a person that's actually done it. Right? Morality. I mean, you can keep the moral code or be compliant to it and still be full of bitterness and still be full of hypocrisy and all of the junk. And that's what Jesus is trying to get us past so that when we have these feelings, we recognize them as feelings, not our identity. Who we are in Christ is what matters, and that's where our focus has to be, or we'll continue to have all of these issues and these suppressed feelings that end up creating all the a large portion of the sickness and, and, uh, and uh, emotional conditions that people go through. So the old saying is, if you don't learn from history, you're 
destined to repeat it. So associated with God, but never knowing God. That's what we're looking at here. People that were connected with God looked upon as people that were godly, and yet they didn't know God at all. I mean, what a horrible condition to find yourself in. So if Jesus showed up and he drew a line in the dirt, who'd be standing on the other side? I mean, that's the question that intrigues me. When you think about the world today, the, the, the way the, you know, morality, I mean, in comparison to the first century is, I mean, I'm not saying they didn't have immoral behavior. Obviously, they did, and we see, we see issues of it. But not on the scale that we see it today, and not in the way that it's accepted. I mean, even from the time I was a kid to today, not that, not that people aren't doing the same thing. It's just that it wasn't accepted. It wasn't paraded. It wasn't, you know, boasted of and, and, and all of those things. Amen? So, who'd be standing on the other side? Would it be people who claimed to be or were considered to be religious? Maybe people who seemed to have it all together? Uh, on the outside, people that seem to have Christianity all figured out. Now, here's what you learn from studying the relationship dynamics that Jesus is teaching in this first century church um, paradigm. It's possible to be closely associated with God without understanding the heart of God part of the journey that all of us are on and have been from the moment we realize there is a God and that we want to know him. People can be so focused on doing and saying the right things that they overlook the importance of just being the right thing. Righteousness, the transformation Righteousness happens from the inside out. You have to seek the heart of God, and his grace and his truth will change you. Praise the Lord. So God cares more about people than he cares about rules. God cares about spiritual righteousness or transformation more than any kind of external righteousness. And that's hard to swallow sometimes when you see people that, I'm born again, and then you see him act stupid and do stupid stuff. But then all I got to do is look in the mirror and just take a brief inventory. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I find myself in the same situation. Maybe not the same particular thing, but some other thing. You know, some, some other thing that causes me to come short of the perfection that religion would demand. We should want the applause of heaven because we're in Christ, not the applause of people because of our outward behavior. We want to get along with people, but I'm, I, I really don't need the appreciation and the pat on the back from all people. I need to know that God loves me, that God's okay with me, that God cares about me, that God's happy with me. So it's not just about who's opposed to him or who's next to him. It's really about who's in him. And for that, you have to constantly focus your thinking, your soul on the spirit realm because your flesh will lie to you 24 hours a day. And the religious world will reinforce that doubt and those questions. And sadly, even much of the secular world were because their only, the only information they have about Jesus is coming from the religious world mainly. So they have this skewed view of, of God as well. And therefore, us as Christians. But if it's about us being in him, then you'll always be on the right side of the line. No matter what. Righteousness of God in Christ because he kept all the rules. Praise the Lord. Amen.
you know, the righteousness of God in Christ. He's done it all. We have to stay focused on that, and we're always on the right side of the line. We're always with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He that is victorious has made us more than conquerors through him. Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap tonight. Praise God. Amen, amen. I'm going to go further with this Sunday, but I just I, I want to kind of set things up because this is what the enemy's doing. We have we know that every every service we have need of miracles, and we have need of them between services. And part of the reason we need miracles is because we're not walking in the reality of who we are in Christ, so that we can receive the blessings of God on a regular basis instead of when we get into a crisis and then need a miracle. Nothing wrong with miracles. But God would rather have us walk in wisdom and be blessed every single day because we know that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Therefore, all that God has for us is ours right now. But see, there's this, there's this constant battle between our soul and the flesh or the spirit. Which way is it going to go? And that's the decision we have to make. And you can't just make it once. You've got to make it multiple times every day in order to really have the fullness of all that God has for us. Amen. God bless you again. Thank you for being here. Look forward to seeing you Saturday. Come, dress appropriately, whatever that means. Praise the Lord and uh, bring an appetite. And there'll be some shade there. As I said, uh, Mike and Susanna provided an awning. I think we've got a small one that my daughter brought. And so there'll be some shade. And if it gets really extremely, you, you need to get away from it for a minute or two you can, or a few minutes, you can always go in the house and and like my grandsons, you're not going to be able to pee in the irises. You'll have to use the bathroom <laughs> in the house. I'm sorry. We're, we're not going natural. Praise Aww. the Lord. So. But I know, I know. It's kind of a disappointment. But we're not, <laughs> we're not going medieval. <laughs> all right. God bless all of you. Have a safe trip home. And uh, enjoy the rest of your week. And we'll see you Saturday.